Zen Buddhism uh, really comes out of China. And our uh, lineage of it, the Soto school, comes out of Dogen Zenji's teachings and writings in the 13th century. And he emphasizes the importance of zazen, or meditation practice, and the importance of just sitting. That if we're trying to attain something, if we're trying to um, you know, become enlightened or become the kind of wise person on the top of the mountain, that's a real setup. We're likely to be chasing our tail our whole life. And so he just emphasizes the um, value of the structure of a kind of wholesome life, uh, the value of being in community, and of just sitting and bearing witness to our life, uh, and a kind of understanding and intimacy that can arise from that. And so that's our school of Buddhism. And the first way to describe meditation, or zazen, is that any definition of it makes it into a thing that you do or that you achieve or that you perfect. And the kind of um, feeling of meditation, the feeling of zazen, is being rather than doing. Just being. We call it just sitting. And this is extremely difficult for us to do, it turns out because we want to put things in the framework of subject and object and a verb to get us there or to attain the thing or whatever it is. And so much of meditation is sitting and noticing that instinct, noticing that conditioning. Nothing wrong with that conditioning, nothing wrong with getting things done and understanding the world in terms of stories or in terms of language. But meditation, in some way, is sitting in a space that's before our story of our life. We're sitting in our life before we turn it into something that we call our life. Another aspect of zazen is we're um, sitting in um, unconstructed stillness, or we're sitting in just the awareness that's naturally part of being alive. So we can't help but be aware when our eyes are open and we're awake. We can't help but have thoughts. We can't help but see when we look outside and feel and hear and smell and all of this. So in a way, we're just sitting, noticing the sensation of being alive. And there are some elements to that. So, you know, as you said, mindfulness is kind of a well-known entity these days. And mindfulness is a... Uh, generally a kind of aspect of meditation and it's the aspect of noticing what we're aware of. As we go through our day we do things on autopilot. It's the incredible capacity of our mind to learn a skill and then to do it without having to think. Like language. What a complex thing to just do naturally. And so this is a kind of um, stepping back before the capacity to just do and to notice what's happening. Oh, there's all these sensations, there's all these thoughts. And part of the activity of meditation that's in noticing is just in um, developing the capacity to stay with what we notice uh, without getting distracted. I came here to Santa Fe in uh, actually the 1970s and had uh, when I was an anthropologist, I had an immediate feeling uh, about the region, its cultural complexity, cultural richness, and also um, that uh, there was a kind of uh, natural spirituality uh, to the Southwest that um, was very magnetizing for me. And um, I was fortunate to uh, be able to uh, receive the building that we're in right now as a gift uh, from uh, Lawrence Rockefeller, um, who uh, was, you know, one of the, the brothers and um, was a very spiritual person, deeply interested in Buddhism and also someone himself who was socially engaged. So when he gave this building to me, um, I had the uh, opportunity to 
have it be a sort of private situation or I, I realized that um, it was a, a chance for me to actually build a center that integrated contemplative practice with social engagement. You know, I think when someone um, steps across the threshold of uh, our temple, um, what they are uh, touching into is this deep aspiration to awaken and to serve others. And so, you know, at the sort of functional level, you know, what are, will they encounter? They'll encounter a beautiful uh, space in which to practice. They'll encounter very nice, conscientious, caring people who are practicing with them. Uh, they'll encounter teachers and seniors who can transmit the Dharma, who can support practice, who bear witness to their spiritual formation. Um, they'll encounter extraordinary teachers, um, uh, really the, some of the greatest teachers in Buddhism, but also in science and in other disciplines uh, have uh, come here to teach and continue to come here to teach. Um, because it's an environment that has a high regard for excellence in communication and also relevance uh, of content. Buddhism is a huge variety of uh, beliefs and practices. And our particular form of Zen Buddhism, even in Zen, there's so many different things where some Zen people would, you know, traditional Zen traditions would say, well, that's not really Zen, you know, engaged Buddhism. And certainly there are other Buddhist traditions that don't even meditate. You know, meditation is not of fundamental importance as it is in Zen, especially in our tradition. So further into that question of what is Buddhism, because there are some Buddhists that really believe in uh, reincarnation in multiple lives. Uh, and um, I think, in, especially in our tradition, you know, not knowing is very important. And to hold the mystery, I think, is very important. And I think it's uh, just scientifically, we don't know that nothing happens with consciousness. We don't even know what consciousness is. You know, starting from my very early interest in consciousness, what's clear is that science has no idea, and Buddhism has a very you know, sophisticated theory about it. Um, but the only way you can really know is to know for yourself. Going to the Himalayas where it's just this huge, vast, open expanse, I think that's why Roshi started it in the first place, was as a pilgrimage. And then she encountered the people who were there who, who asked for help, and that's how it started. So the pilgrimage was kind of the primary thing and continues to be the foundation for why we go. Nepal already is a very low resource country, you know, as a country was, and its health system is not very good. And also because the people who uh, live in this mountain area are my, what they call um, indigenous group of people and quite marginalized, underserved. Geographically, it's very hard to access. I did my primary school um, in Indo, which is about about 13,000 feet. So I did there and then I came down to Kathmandu for, to do my secondary school and nursing school. And then I went back in 2011. So I started working as a nurse, um, but I have very less resources. And also I have like very less skill and experience. You know, I'm trained to be a nurse in hospital, carry doctor's order and provide care actually. But then I'm in this community almost being a doctor, you know, like you have to do everything on your own. I've seen a lot of uh, moms dying while childbirth and like how much women kind of suffer. And also because a community where there is not much um, care or, you know, like um, focus given to the women, there is no way for them to actually like advocate for their needs. And the same with healthcare, and especially in these areas, people don't speak, um, even if there are healthcare providers, which are very rare, if sometimes they show up, they don't speak the national language, you know, so it's, and women are mostly restricted to their homes, so it's always harder for them to access the very, like, little healthcare. It's one of the reasons why I am very attracted to women's health. In my personal life, I have, kind of went through lots of lots of things like losing my parents you know being married at early age and then walking out of that marriage and 
But then equally with meeting different people, you know, I've been very lucky with meeting people um, and who kind of resonate very well with what I want to do. You know, there's so many people who come here, seekers who come here to practice in some way, being um, closer to their own lives, being closer to nature. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they come to the Southwest. And I think the kind of relationship of the sky and the earth here is impossible to miss. And for me, at least, it broadens the sense of my own mind, my own life, and highlights this connection uh, to the outside world, to the natural world.